From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cube Studios here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. We're here for coverage of AWS Public Sector Summit. This is the Cube Virtual with our quarantine crew going out and covering the AWS Public Sector Virtual Summit. We, our next guest is Matthew Cornelius, Executive Director for the Alliance for Digital Innovation. Matthew, thanks for joining me today for part of AWS Virtual Public Sector Summit. That's great, thanks John, appreciate you having me. Um, I know that uh, John Wood and I have been talking about this organization and some of the, um, the ambition and the relevance of it. Um, so I think it's a super important story. I want to get your thoughts on this and, and open, unpack kind of the mission. But for starters, tell us what is the Alliance for Digital Innovation? When were you formed? What's the mission? What do you do? Sure. Um, yeah, so ADI was formed about two years ago um, to create a new advocacy group uh, that could focus explicitly on getting cloud forward, commercial, uh, highly innovative companies into the public sector. Um, so the government uh, technology space has traditionally been dominated by a lot of the legacy vendors, folks that are very happy with vendor lock-in, uh, folks that have an outdated business model that, that would not suffice in the commercial sector. Uh, so why does it have to be that way for government? And uh, ADI joined, uh, started with about eight members, uh, has since grown, we're, we're approaching two dozen now. Uh, so we've had a lot of growth. And I think a lot of the response that you've seen in the public sector, especially to the uh, COVID crisis and the response and relief efforts have uh, made this organization and our mission more relevant now than ever. There's, there's no way yeah. that you can go back to this, uh, the previous way of doing business. So uh, adopting all these commercial technologies, uh, changing your business model, changing your operating model, uh, and really use an emerging technology to deliver all these mission services is critical. You know, one of the things that I've been reporting on for many, many years is this idea of modernization, certainly on the commercial side with cloud, um, it's been really important and Amazon has done extremely well from a business standpoint. We all know that where that's going. The issue that's happening now is the modernization is kicking in. So the government has started to move down this track. And we've seen the procurement start to get more modernized, move from buying manuals to actually having yeah. modern stuff and in comes COVID-19. You couldn't have accelerated, you couldn't have pulled the future forward fast enough to an already struggling federal government, in my opinion. And I've talked to many people in DC and they're all the young crowd saying, hey, old government, get modern. And then this comes almost, it's almost a throwing the rock on your back and you're sinking. This is a problem. What's your take on this? Because this is, a, you're trying to solve a problem modernizing, but now you've got COVID-19 coming in it compounds the complexity and the challenge. What's your sure. thoughts and reaction to that? Yeah, so it, it, there's a multifaceted response to this. So part of it is what I like to say is the government's done uh, more in the past four months than it's done in the past 14 years when it comes to modernization and adopting commercial capabilities. I think with individual agencies, you've seen those, those agencies, I, I will name a couple like the Small Business Administration, uh, the General Services Administration where I used to work, uh, folks that were already heavily invested in cloud, heavily invested in modern digital tools and modern digital processes, uh, they were able to weather this storm and to deal, especially in SBA's case, with a, a dramatic increase in their mission. I mean, running the Paycheck Protection Program is something unlike uh, an organization of that size has ever seen. Um, and from a technology standpoint, um, they had a lot of good stories uh, that are worth telling. And I think it's because they were so uh, cloud forward. I think. Um, one of the other interesting points that has, has really come to light over the past four months is so much of the, uh, so many of the issues around modernization were cultural. Now, of course, there are some that are legal, there's acquisition, there's the way agencies are appropriated in finance and the way they can spend their money. But uh, by and large, all of these agencies had to move to maximum telework. Uh, they had to get rid of all of these outdated on-premise processes, these paper-based processes that they had. And although uh, surely there were some bumps in the road and that was not easy, especially for these folks working around the clock to keep their agencies operational, to make sure citizens are getting the services they need, especially during this crisis. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great success stories that you see there. And because of this, uh, no one, even if they're allowed to go back into the office or when they're allowed to go back in the office, people are going to understand how much more productive they are 
how, how much more technologically capable they are. And that's not just CIO offices, that's people on programs in the front lines, uh, delivering services, that's uh, mission response. It's, it, we've really seen it uh, power forward over the last four months. You know, Matthew, I've been very vocal, you know, given that I'm kind of the old guy, get off my lawn, kind of tech <laughs> commentary. I've seen the, the waves and, and I remember coming in when I was in my young, uh, late 20s and 30s, old school enterprises, the commercial business, wouldn't do business with startups. You had to be sure. approved, we're entrenched vendors supporting those things. And then in comes the web, in comes the 90s, and, the, and then the web came, it was more agile. You had startups that were more uh, open and working with commercial vendors. It seems like we're seeing that movie play out in public sector where you have the entrenched incumbents, they got the town wired, who knows what's going on. It's been called the Beltway Bandits for years and Theresa sure. Carlson and I talked about this all the time. But now the government ha can be agile and startups need to be part of it because the, these new solutions, like whether it's video conferencing or virtual events, things like we do, new solutions are coming that need to come in, it's hard. Can you share yeah. how a company, whether it's a startup or a new solution can come in and work with the government because the perception is it's impossible. Yeah, and part of why ADI exists is to break that down. One, to, to recruit more members to join us, uh, to, to really help drive commercial innovation in the government. And we have some very large uh, companies that like AWS and others that, that do an awful lot of work with the government. And we have a lot of smaller startups that are interested in dipping their toe in there. And so we try to help them demystify uh, how it is that you go about working with the government. Um, I think there have been uh, some very, again, some good success stories on this front. I think that there are lots of uh, places like the Department of Defense, um, a lot of the folks, the intelligence community, some other agencies, uh, they have authorities, uh, they have uh, partnership programs that make it easier for folks to adopt commercial innovation. They have uh, unique authorities like other transaction authorities or commercial solutions offerings um, that really lower the barrier for uh, new technologies to be piloted and potentially scaled inside government. But that's not the case across lots of agencies. And that's why we advocate broadly for um, getting the acquisition process to move at the speed of technology. Uh, if, if there are good authorities that work in some agencies, uh, let's get them to everybody. Let's have everybody try it because the, the people in the agencies, the acquisition professionals, the technical professionals, they have to be committed to working with industry. So the industry is committed to working with them. And as a former uh, federal employee myself, I worked at the Office of Management and Budget and the General Service Administration. Um, I always uh, was upset at the fact that the government is very good at speaking to industry, but not very good at working with industry and, and, and listening. And so uh, we see a lot more of that now, and I think part of that is a response to COVID, but it's also the recognition that um, you can't do things the way you used to do it. The traditional butts and seats contracting business model where everybody in between a federal employee and that outsourced uh, service provider, uh, you don't need all those people there. You can do it yourself and be just as effective and, and get all the real outcomes you're looking for with commercial innovation. It sounds like ADI, your priority is to make things go fast, can be modernized. So I have to ask you the question that's on my mind, probably on everyone's mind is, what are the key conversations or messages you provide to the agencies, heads or members of Congress to get them excited about this, to take action, to support what you're doing? Because let's face it, most of these guys up in the hill or gals now, most of them come from law, law backgrounds. They don't have a tech sure. background. So, you know, that's a complaint that I've heard, you know, in the hallways uh, in DC is the guy making all the decisions doesn't know jack about tech. No, it's, it's a great point. Um, and, you know, when we, when we advocate uh, up on the Hill, uh, there's, there's a law that uh, I don't think a lot of folks pay an awful lot of attention to. Everybody likes the nice new things that are coming from Capitol Hill. Uh, but there's a great piece of legislation from, from 1994 called the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act. We actually did a, a, some tremendous uh, original research at ADI about a year ago and released an, an interesting report that got a lot of uptick here. And most people don't even understand that the law requires you uh, to do market research and see if there's a commercial product or service that meets your need before you go down building any sort of specific requirements or, or building out some sort of long procurement process. And so a lot of what we are doing is educating folks, not just on what the law says, but on why this, are, why these can lead to better outcomes for agencies. I mean, I truly believe that most of the folks in government, whether they're technical folks or not, want to do the best thing. But if you're, if you're a company trying to do business with the government, you have to go through what, what is often a, a five or six or sometimes 10 person human supply chain 
uh, there's there's someone in government who wants your solution because it addresses a particular problem. And between them and you, the company, there's all sorts of additional uh, bureaucratic overlays and and folks that are not technical that have other incentives and other priorities uh, that don't always lead to the most optimal uh, procurement outcome. So there's an educational component. There's a cultural component. We, we need more champions inside government. We need not just better technology that's wanting to work with the government, but we also need smarter, better people inside that understand the technology and can get to it the way they need yeah. to get to it so that they can deliver mission. As someone like me who's in the technology business, who loves entrepreneurship, loves business, loves impact of technology, I'm not a, a public servant and I'm not, a, not that up to speed on all the government kind of inside baseball. So I kind of look at it a little bit differently. I've always been a big proponent of public-private partnerships. That's been kicked around in the past, kind of like digital transformation, kind of cliche, but there's been some pockets of success there. But if you look at the future, in the role of influence and the commercial impact, just China, for instance, I was just riffing the other day with someone around China, doesn't necessarily go through government channels for how they deal with the United States. There's a little commercial, they have intellectual property issues going on, people saying they're stealing, they're investing in the United States, so it's a commercial influence. So as the government has to look at these commercial influences, they then have to modernize their workforce, their workloads, their, their applications, their workplaces. The work is not just and workloads, it's workplace, workforce. So if you had your way, how would you like to see the, the landscape of the federal technology um, piece of this look like in five years? Because there's now new influence vectors coming in that are outside the channels of federal purview. No, it's, it's a great question. And, and I appreciate you bringing up the other complexities around nation state actors and China and everything else. Um, uh, obviously supply chain security and, and being able to deal with legitimate security uh, threats um, is critical uh, when you're inside government. I mean, your first uh, your first uh, sort of purpose is to do no harm uh, and to make sure that you're keeping citizen data, whether it's classified or unclassified, secure. Um, I we think at ADI that there's a great balance to be had there, um, and part of that is if you're working with American companies and you're you're adopting the the best and most agile and most uh, you know, innovative commercial technology that America has to offer, that's going to make uh, our industry uh, more competitive uh, and position it better on the commercial market. And it's also going to make government agencies more effective. They're going to be able to meet their mission faster. They're going to be able to lower costs. They're going to be able to shift what are going to be tighter and tighter budgets over the next uh, four or five or 10 years to other areas because they're not wasting so much money on these old systems and this, this old business processes, this old way of doing business. So uh, that is one of the balances that we have to take from an advocacy standpoint. We have to understand that um, uh, supply chain security, cybersecurity are real issues, but security can also be an enabler to innovation and not an impediment. Uh, and if a lot of the commercial capabilities that are coming out now and a lot of these companies like the ones ADI represents want to do business with the government, and their commercial products uh, can inherently be more secure than a lot of these old bespoke systems or, or uh, you know, old uh, business practices. That's good for uh, not just federal agencies, but that's good for citizens and that's good for our national defense and our economy. You know, I look at our landscape and, and being in, in, you know, born, being an American born here and looking at other emerging countries, certainly China is one example of becoming their world digital needs. Even other areas where 5G and the telecom has made great internet access, you're seeing digital native countries. So as we modernize and our lawmakers have more tech savvy uh, and things become digital native, the commercial enabling piece is a huge thing. Having that enabling technology because it creates wealth and jobs and, and, and other things. So you got, the, you got three things, the digital native country, enabling technologies to promote good and wealth and an and, and engine of economic value, and then societal impact. What's your take on those three kind of pillars? Because we're kind of, as a country, coming into this world order and look at the younger generation, they're all screaming for it. We're digital native and all kinds of arbitrage there, fake news, misinformation. Then you got enabling technologies with the cloud, and then you got societal benefits, future of elections and everything else. So what's your thoughts? Because it sounds like you're thinking about these things as in your digital innovation alliance. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one thing I will say, and as someone that was a former federal employee, uh, the one thing we need more of, whether you're on the executive branch, you're in Congress, uh, we need more people that, like you said, are digital native, that understand technology, that also want to be inside government, either running programs or dealing with policy issues. Um, we need as many good new ideas and folks with real, legitimate, necessary and, and current skills uh, in there. Because if you don't understand the technology, you don't understand, uh, the, like you said, the societal impacts, you don't understand the business impacts of, of government decision making, and the government can drive markets. I mean, it, we are, especially in the middle of coronavirus, we're spending trillions of dollars to keep folks afloat and to uh, and we're using technology primarily as a way to make that happen. So uh, the first thing I would say is we need uh, we continue uh, need to continue sorry we need to continue to recruit and and retain and train the best and the brightest uh, to go into government service because it is it is a joy and a privilege to serve government and we've got to have better smarter technical people in there or we're going to keep getting these same outcomes like like you've mentioned uh, you know over the past thirty plus years. I think we're in a John F. K. Um, JFK moment where John F. Kennedy said, you know, ask not what you can, your country can do for you, what you can do for your country, moment in the modern era, and that was the 60s, that was, we saw the revolution of, of, of that happened there. We're kind of having a digital version of that now where it's an opportunity for people to get involved, younger generations, and make change rather than arguing about it. So I really feel really strongly about this. So um, I think this is an opportunity. Your reaction to that? No, I, that's a that's a fantastic point. Uh, I hadn't really thought about the JFK uh, resemblance, but it's it, it is I, from an industry standpoint, I think that that is what is happening uh, with these emerging technology companies and even some of the large companies. They understand that this is their way to contribute uh, to the country, who, whose R and D dollars and whose these public private partnerships helped a lot of these folks grow and and become the companies they are now. At least started started them down that road, and so. For us at the Alliance for Digital Innovation and the companies that are a part of us, um, that is uh, sort of purposeful to who we are. Um, we do what we do and we want the government uh, to build stronger relationships and to use this technology because it does serve mission. I mean, we exclusively focus on the public sector um, uh, focus of these companies and um, it's, a, it's tremendously valuable when you see uh, a federal agency who had, who spent five or 10 years and, and hundreds of millions of dollars and still not solving a problem, and then they can pick up uh, the, the commercial off the shelf technology from a company that we represent and can solve that problem for $5 million and do it in six months. I mean, that's truly rewarding. And whether you're inside government or out, we should all celebrate that and we should find ways to make that the norm and not the exception and take all that hate and violence and challenge it towards voting and getting involved. I'm a big <laughs> proponent of that. Matthew, thank you so much for taking the time. I'll give you the last word. Take a minute to um, put a plug in for the Alliance for Digital Innovation. Who are the charter members? Who's involved? I know John Wood from Telos uh, is a charter member. Who's involved? How did it all start? Yeah. Give, give a taste yeah. of the culture and who's involved. Yeah, uh, thanks John. So. Yeah, like you mentioned, uh, we have uh, tremendous members. Um, AWS is obviously a great partner. We have a lot of uh, big uh, companies that are involved, uh, Google Cloud, uh, Salesforce, uh, Palantir, Palo Alto Networks. We also have great mid-size and small companies. You think of a Telos, you think of a SAP NS2, an IronNet, you think of a sale drone. We've got companies that whose technology, product and service offerings uh, exp you know, run the range uh, for government needs. and. You know, we all come together because we understand that the government can and should and must do better uh, to buy and leverage commercial technology to meet mission outcomes. So that is what we focus on. And frankly, um, we have seen tremendous growth uh, since COVID started. I mean, we are 24 members now. We were at 18 just four months ago. But I, I like to say that ADI is an organization whose mission is more important and more resonant now, not just in the technology parts of government, but at the secretary level, at the chief acquisition officer level, on co in Congress, you know, uh, we are folks that are trying to paint the future. We're doing a positive vision for change for what government can and should be. 
and for all of those other technology companies that want to be a part of that, that, that understand that the government can do better and that has ideas for making it work better and, and for getting commercial innovation into government faster uh, to solve mission outcomes and to, and to increase that trust between citizens and, and government. Um, we want you. So uh, if, if folks are interested in joining, you got people that are watching out there, uh, you can go to allianceforgitualinnovation.org. Uh, we're always accepting uh, interested applicants, and we look forward to continuing this message, uh, showing some real outcomes, and, and helping uh, the government for the next year, five years, 10 years, uh, really uh, mature and modernize faster and more effectively than it has before. Great mission, love what you're doing. I think the future of democracy depends on these new models to be explored candidly and out in the open. And it's a great mission, we support that. Thanks for taking the time, Matthew, appreciate it. Thanks, John. Have a great Public Sector Summit. Okay, this is theCUBE's coverage of AWS Public Sector Virtual Summit. I'm John Furrier here in theCUBE Virtual. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more coverage.